I'm uh, Jeff Schoen O'Keefe. I'm the executive director of Zen Peacemakers. And uh, I just feel uh, so pleased and honored to have Io join us today. Uh, you know, there's an expression, uh, she needs no introduction, but um, uh, uh, Io is uh, uh, well known throughout our broader Buddhist community uh, in the West. Um, has uh, two doctorate degrees and is a community Dharma leader in insight meditation and published uh, several books at this point and numerous articles. And uh, she will be joined uh, by uh, my colleague and dear friend Willie Mukay Smith, who is a board member uh, of Zen Peacemakers, as well uh, um, a practitioner. Uh, at the uh, Village Zendo in uh, New York City. And um, I will, uh, with that introduction, I will step back and uh, let Ayo and, and Muke uh, take, take the microphone, as it were. And uh, we will, uh, our session is set for 90 minutes, um, and we will have time for question and answer. Uh, uh, at a point, and we'll let you know then. So if something occurs to you, go ahead and make a note. Um, and if you're not muted, please do so. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Io and, and, uh, and Willie. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Io, it's nice to see you again after this five minutes from five minutes ago. So rumor has it you wrote a book. It's true. Well, I'm sure some of us have read your book and some of them not. So, uh, you know, I have, and uh, it's a, a broad range of, of interesting topics. And um, so, please share. Thank you. Thank you, Muke. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you. Thank all of you for uh for hosting me and for allowing me to have this time with you all. So <clears throat> I wanna say a few things. Uh, that is uh, that I do wanna talk about Black and Buddhist, the book a little bit. Um, I wanna say just something about a project that I'm working on as it relates to the trial that is captivating us at the moment um, called Buddhist Justice Reporter, the George Floyd Trials. But what I really hope that we can spend most of our time doing is having a conversation because when, when I was invited to join you, I thought, oh, here's an opportunity for me to learn from uh, peacemakers, international peacemakers who have been immersed in cultures where there has been mass murder, genocide, so on. Um, and what I hope uh, will come out of that exchange is that I have a better idea about what's happening in the United States context. I mean, I feel like I have an idea about it, but you know, when you have an idea that no one's talking about, then you have to, you know, <laughs> you question yourself, is it me? <laughs> so that's what I hope that we get to do today. Um, is that okay? Does anyone have, I'm going to look at the gallery view and see if there's any objection to us talking about those things. Okay, all right, cool. Thank you, thumbs up from a few folks. Thank you. Okay, so Black and Buddhist, uh, what Buddhism can teach us about race, resilience, transformation and freedom. So Willie and I met in uh, Muke, <laughs> Willie Muke Smith, uh, Reverend Willie Muke Smith and I met in 2018 at Union Theological Seminary. Um, Union hosted a gathering of African descended uh, Buddhist leaders uh, from uh, the United States and other parts of the world. And that's where I first met Willie. And then we, Muke, <laughs> and then we met again in person in 2019 when Spirit Rock Meditation Center hosted an additional gathering, another gathering of African descended 
Buddhist leaders. In 2018 at Union, there were about 33, 35 of us. And in 2019 at Spirit Rock, there were, I think, about 90 of us. So um, both events were incredible in terms of just getting to know each other. You know, we're separated by, uh, by traditions and lineages, um, but we are united by culture, right, and recognition. So um, just to be with other Black folks in Dharma leadership, uh, where we could talk about our lives and our, our joys, our practices, and our challenges, in particular, uh, leading uh, communities that are not people by people of color, um, and it's just exchanging ideas about how to hold all of that um, in both instances were uh, uh, like homecomings, like, like family reunions. Uh, so I'm glad, I'm glad to be here uh, with Muke and with all of you. At the 2018 gathering, we had, uh, after we had a few days together, just us as leaders, then um, our event was open to the public. So there were, I don't know, maybe 200 people in the audience on those last days, and there were two panels. I was on one of those panels, and there was a question posed about a dilemma someone was having in terms of um, Buddhist philosophy. Basically, it had to come from, it came from her, her understanding of what Thich Nhat Hanh was teaching. You know, uh, she, she took from those teachings that uh, Buddhist practitioners are not supposed to take sides, right? Not supposed to take sides. And also, but what do you do when, when there's injustice? How do you not take a side in, in that regard? And so I blurted out, which I do sometimes, I may blurt out something today. I blurted out that Thich Nhat Hanh um, actually does take sides. Um, he takes the side of, of compassion. He takes the side of love. Uh, he takes the side of, of right doing. And so, yes, that's the side he takes. And then I went on to say um, that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, or maybe I said it before that, I said Thich Nhat Hanh is black. And there was a gasp. I remember there was a gasp in the audience and a silence, like I had just sucked the, all the air out of the room to say something like that. And so recognizing that that's what the dynamic that was taking place. I then said that what I meant by that was that um, when the United States was bombing Vietnam, um, that's when, he, when Thich Nhat Hanh and Vietnamese people became black. And so I meant black in that, in that um, way of being oppressed by white supremacy, imperialism, colonialistic forces, and so on. So then I was approached by an editor at uh, Shambhala, Matt Zeppelin, who asked me if I, if I wanted to write a book. I had already written a book on Buddhism and some articles. And so I was open to writing. Um, when we began talking about ideas or themes for the book, he suggested uh, a theme from something I had written before in an article called uh, Buddhism in the Age of Black Lives Matters, which is in Lion's Roar. Uh, in that article, I talk about collective liberation. And he said, well, why not write on that? And I said, I could write on collective liberation by myself, but it would be much more fruitful if it were a collective endeavor. So uh, I convinced him that a, a book, uh, an anthology, of African descended Buddhist leaders would be would much better touch on the subject than just having a sole or lone author. And that's how we began um, the creation of this book. Uh, Black and Buddhist is a collection of essays, chapters by African descended Buddhist leaders across traditions and uh, across uh, genders, across uh, sexualities across a variety of philosophical perspectives and could everyone please mute themselves thank you and uh and we did not cheryl giles and i who was cheryl giles is the co-editor uh cheryl and i did not expressly state to the authors what they had to write about we said the book is about being black and buddhist 
you write about what you want to write about. And that's in essence what the book is. What I, it came out in December and what I have heard um, from a variety of people are in essence, if I can crystallize it into two basic things. One is from a black perspective, people have often said, I appreciate this book so much because it is a mirror of my life. It validates uh, my thinking, my culture, my mindset, um, and my, my love for the Dharma as a black person. Uh, white people have said to me, several have said to me, what I really appreciate about, appreciate about this book, two things. One, the vulnerability that is expressed by these black people because it gives me a window into what it means to be black. And so that is a uh, black and Buddhist in a nutshell. Any questions there? Should we take questions only at the end or? Let's, let's go on. I wanted to talk a little bit okay. about the, the trial. Let's okay. talk about that because I'm sure uh, it's caused a lot of thinking uh, about mm -hmm. what's what we're looking at uh, uh, those of us who've been watching the news I've done watching very little of it but mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people have been watching the news and 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 uh, this the stirring up uh, I was at a um, my uh, the, I co-lead a uh, people of color group in my sangha and mm -hmm. one person spoke up and said well this guy is gonna walk he's mm -hmm. gonna walk you know, he says it's gonna be repeated right back to the way that it's always been and, uh, and, you know, it, it, there is a dilemma, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know hope, I'm hoping that justice will be done, but, you know, what's to say that this is just a repeat of what we've seen over these many years? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, yeah, let's talk about the trial. So I have uh, a law degree, I, but I have never practiced law. Okay, so just I just want to say those two things. One of the reasons why I went to law to law school is because I wanted to become a more effective uh, activist. Right, I used to be extremely shy. Like I, public speaking would terrify me, and I would avoid it at all costs. So, but I had strong emotions about certain things in the world, and I thought, you know, what is it? what is it that these people around me, I was working at the ACLU at the time as an intern, what is it about these people? What do they have that I don't have that allows them to be able to do what they do? I thought, oh, oh a law degree. Gosh darn, I've got to go to law school. That's the thing. So anyway, went um, and still have a, a, um, a desire to advocate for goodness, right? I still have that. And so I was living in St. Paul, Minnesota. At the time, George Floyd was tortured and murdered. And I think it's really important to say that he was tortured. tortured. He was tortured. There's nothing in, um, in that arrest, in that eight plus minutes that is congruent with any policing practice in um, democratic society, right? But for some reason, we're not using that word torture. And I wanna get back to, to how we go about choosing certain words, right? In our political discourse. But we're not using the word torture. He was tortured and murdered. And after months of, of trying to survive the pandemic, right? So I was every morning getting up to practice as, as usual, nothing different about my practice, but I was angry. Like waking up with anger and going to bed with anger, peppered with rage throughout the day, every day for months. And that is not my typical you know, personality. It was disturbing me. It was like, I'm sitting, chanting, you know, uh, loving kindness, meditation, all these things, and I'm still angry. So after George Floyd was tortured and murdered, 
you know, the, the rage was rising to a higher degree. I finally got up the nerve and the courage to go to the George Floyd Memorial and where he was killed. And something about being there and observing people, I was taking photographs, I was observing people, uh, I was crying. Something about being there and just sitting there and observing broke something open in my heart to where I could begin to imagine like really living fully, being able to be creative again, um, to want to be connected again. Um, the combination of being at that memorial as well as um, seeing on TV, the um, coalitions of people arm in arm across all kinds of differences, standing up against police brutality as well as my own experience being immersed in, um, in a, whew, I don't even know how to call it. Let, let's just say um, during some of the uprisings, riots, whatever you wanna call them, I was surrounded by police officers marching in the hundreds and I had not experienced anything like that. Anyway, my point in, in all that is saying the combination of all those things then led me to reach out to Buddhist practitioners, Zen practitioners in the Twin Cities, BIPOC in particular, uh, Black Indigenous people of color, to say, let's get together and talk about how all of this has impacted us and see what comes of it. And let's take time to, 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 to get to know each other over five months of getting together, uh, we arrived at this project we're calling the Buddhist Justice Reporter, the George Floyd Trials, because we, we came to an agreement and understanding, shared understanding that um, a human rights uh, violation had taken place in our home, right? In our neighborhood uh, with one of our neighbors. Uh, that there would be a trial. Oh, I'm sorry, not necessarily in this order. That the response to that torture and killing was international. Unlike other killings of unarmed black people, this one was different. And it sparked an international uh, show of solidarity against police brutality which is not just a US phenomenon, right? It's a worldwide phenomenon, repression, governmental repression. And when we also, we also learned that the trial, unlike other trials, would be uh, um, publicized. It would be open for all to see. And so this is an opportunity for us to learn how it is that police officers walk, as Willie Mukay Smith was saying that someone else said, this guy's just gonna walk like the others have. How, you know, how is it that um, we even have a trial? That's unusual. And that's what I write about in the book. It's unusual that there's even a trial right? with murder charges. Even that's unusual. Unusual that it's being aired for all to see. And I think we understand why that is because to keep doing things like this behind closed doors is gonna result in violence. We need to find a different way to, to deal with these realities. So um, what we hope with the Buddhist Justice Reporter, and by the way, if you wanna know more about what we're doing, our website is BuddhistJustice.com. What we hope is that we can provide a forum for people who are interested in what is happening in this trial that we can support, um, say, the not clinging to a particular outcome. And by not clinging to a particular outcome, what else can we learn that will help support our activism going forward? Because things can change, things do change. There was a time, there was a time where a black person couldn't be on a jury. There was a time where a black person couldn't even testify on their own behalf because they were uh, 
considered innately not credible, right? So there is the potential to continue on this path of, of humanization. Um, and also rules of evidence change over time as well. What are the rules of evidence that are at play in this trial now that could potentially um, replicate the same kind of lack of accountability that police officers have been not been held to? So that's what this project is about. Um, and one person, oh, and in addition, Tuesday evenings, there's a sit. Uh, there's a sit It's called the Truth and Justice Vigil that is hosted by Stacy McClendon at Common Ground Meditation Center in uh, Minneapolis. Common Ground is also one of uh, uh, Buddhist justice reporters uh, um, partners. And our project is also being uh, funded in part by the Katali Foundation. So Willie Muke Smith, is there anything else you wanted to say about the trial or want to talk about? Well, I, uh, I guess I'm still, I'm somewhat uh, skeptical. And I'm skeptical, and I hear what you're saying about, you know, that it's unusual that everyone is being, this is open for everyone to see. But as you can hear, but what's to say? something's going to happen and then you know the uh, police officer walks and um mm -hmm. and, and and you know i have witnessed it before and you know there's some there's a feeling i have about geez you know here we go again you know, here we go again you know um yeah you know it's an all too familiar feeling right so but let me ask you this question this skepticism and that I'm going to also add in pessimism and lack, lack, I'm going to add this, even though you didn't say this, lack of faith that human beings will be anything other than what we already are. Yeah. Okay. So my, my question is, or my hope, my hope is that regardless of the outcome that people who are I say, moved by the tenets, if you will, of, of uh, non-harming, of justice, of clear seeing, uh, of solidarity, of bearing witness, of not knowing, will do what we can do with what we have, right? Right. Instructions to the cook with what we have to move the needle an inch and if not an inch, half an inch, and if not half an inch, a quarter of an inch towards justice, regardless of the outcome. Because one of the things that I love about uh, this practice, our practices, is that we differentiate ourselves, mm. right, from what is ignoble, right? We do what we do what we believe to do is right, regardless of whether the cycle of suffering continues, you know, the cycle of ignorance, the cycle of racism and white supremacy, regardless if that continues, what do we do to offer our disruption to that? Well, it's a work in progress, isn't it? Yeah, oh yes. It's, it's all work. about progress, yes. So no, it's work in and, and, and process. And yes. process. Mm -hmm. Because I do believe we are some, we're coming from a, a, a individual silos at times mm -hmm. in terms of how we want to approach this. And, 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 and it does mean to, there needs to be some owning up to how we've segregated ourselves with, within even the Buddhist community. Oh, yes. This is an opportunity for us to look at all, the, all of that. Right. Yeah, if, we that, if we choose to do it. Well, that's the bottom line, right? If we yeah. choose to do it. Yes. You know? And, uh, you know, there are lots of times when I've been in situations where I have to deal with the guilt. Uh, oh, we should be doing something more. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it just seems to stifle or slow down the progress. Mm. 
and and that's the part that's frustrating for me it's like mm -hmm. can we just kind of put this aside and get to what's really going on here as opposed to letting whatever the guilt come up mm -hmm. that slows down the process mm -hmm. it is about looking in the mirror really 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 honestly and you know how hard that is to do. Oh, do I know? <laughs> but it, maybe as spiritual friends, we can help each other do that. Like, okay, I'll help you look in the mirror. You help me look in the mirror. We hold each other as we both look in the mirror. And, right. then, we, and then we take a step forward, knowing that each of us has our own conditioning that we bring to every situation, our own limitations, our own fears, and so on. And, and if guilt is there, that's part of it. God, deal with it don't want the guilt to become shame and then no. be completely paralyzed, right? But. <laughs> but, no but, no more buts. No more buts, Willie Mukay Smith. Um, and, right, because we could, we could also get in the cycle of but, right? Uh, yes, and negating can. and yeah. constantly negating the, yes. the opportunities in front of us. Right. And, but not looking at why we do that. Correct. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I'll just sit, I'll just sit and, and send out, I'll send out loving kindness. Yep. I'll send it out. You know what you mean. Rather than be the loving kindness. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that and that's the hard part is being the loving kindness. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. hard and it's worth it. You know what's also hard? Having your face and your whole body down on the ground with somebody's knee on your neck on your neck while you gasp for breath that's hard too yep right so what's harder yep it's amazing as i hear you talk and in my with my own experience i find my i'm silently tapping my foot here because i know i'm pissed off and, and because uh, this is what I, as a man of color, have to experience all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, and how do I take, you know, use my practice not to, I know it's very tempting to want to thrash out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that happen. Well, I know you're not. <laughs> We're I not going to do any thrash. We already made that agreement. I know. Before the recording started. Right. <laughs> but still, you know, I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, the frustration and the anger is there. Of course. Yes. You know? Yeah. And you know what, what if, what if we all could feel some of that? I was talking to someone the other day about uh, the shootings of Asian women in Atlanta yep. and, and how um, sometimes the press and I don't think it's intentional because it's just about reporting. When you're reporting, you're, you're offering an abstract of the reality, right? Your abstract. Of, but sometimes in the press, you know, um, they'll say the Asian community is, you know, torn apart or torn up about these, this shooting, right? Um, or the Asian community is angry about this. Well, I'm angry about it, right? right. I'm angry about that. Um, the black community is upset because of blah, blah, blah. Well, aren't there white people who are upset about this too, right? I don't think um, that what we're reading and what's reported reflects the whole experience. Mm -hmm. So you're not the only one angry about how black people are treated. And not only black people are angry about how black people are treated, right? There are other people who are angry, who are upset, who are um, trying to figure out how to make this world a better place. So you're not alone, is what I'm saying. And I don't well, feel alone. Well, what was encouraging for me when uh, the, the day after the murder of George Floyd was I saw white faces. That was very encouraging to me because I felt like, oh, mm -hmm. thank goodness, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Thank right. goodness. And it wasn't the, actually the first time. So if you, if, uh, if you will recall in um, Virginia, Charlottesville, uh, during the Unite oh, yeah. the Right movement and you know, uh, gathering, 
there were a lot of white people countering that. It was a glimpse of a world that we don't see that often, mm -hmm. but it's there. It's like, that's where my hope is. Like, oh, okay, young people, you may, you may diss us because that's just part of how it, how it goes, right? Younger people dissing the you know, older generation. But what I see in the younger people is that they did learn some things from us, that they are carrying forward. They are bolder than we, than we were at their ages. Mm -hmm. But safer. We made a safer world for them to be bolder, right? right. And so we just keep going like this, right? In a cycle, creating a safer environment. The new activists come through, they are bolder and we support them and they are creating an environment that will be uh, freer for the next generation. Right. And we all do it together. So do not despair, Reverend, do not despair. This, we are here with Zen Peacemakers International international and that's what i want to talk about like what is it what is it we have learned right from our various uh opportunities to bear witness uh to the atrocities that human beings can commit against others what can we learn from that bearing witness that can help us understand where we are in the united states right now because what i see is an unwillingness to name what is real Again, George Floyd was tortured before he died, but we're not saying that. And I want to throw out another word just to make this point, and then um, maybe we can open it up for conversation. Okay. If, if you're so inclined. On what happened on January 6th at the Capitol, the words that have been used have been uprising, right? There was an uprising, there was an insurrection. I have yet to hear or read a consistent uh, description of the event as a coup attempt. In the United States, we had a coup attempt on January 6th. Inspired by, if not led by, the former president of the United States who then in a second impeachment trial was acquitted. Acquitted of a coup attempt. Acquitted of, some would say the most antithetical, democratically antithetical thing you can do as a president of this country. Acquitted of a coup attempt. Why don't we want to use the word torture in the United States? Why are we not using the word coup? And why are we not using the word genocide? And so that's what I want to talk about. And if our collective wisdom can help, under, help us understand what's actually happening here, then maybe our response to what's happening here might be different. Okay, so let's open it up to conversation. So there is a feature uh, where it says, uh, I think it's in participants, is it? That you can raise your hand? Well, yeah, it's, it, it's in uh, reactions, I believe. Reaction, reactions, okay. Uh, if you can raise your hand and Jeff will be the person to uh, steer us to whoever has a question. And uh, for those that came in after we uh, first opened up, just a reminder, we are recording, so, um, so you're aware. But please, uh, feel free to, uh, uh, you're, you're on more than one screen, so I can't visually see you if you wave your, uh, wave your hand. So go to reactions and raise your electronic hand and I'll be able to see you that way. Would it help if I if I put out the first question? Well, uh, that, that might. Uh, 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 Genjo, uh, uh, Roshi, you've got your hand up. Uh, oh, okay, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, great. 
and and then maybe you can prompt oh, you know, if you want to. Uh, Genjo, go ahead, unmute yourself, and. Uh... I was just going to say um, I'm white. I grew up in a racist uh, culture. I think we've grow, grown up in a white racist world. Uh, I accept uh, coup. I accept uh, torture uh, in use in the context that you are saying. But uh, aren't we all of African descent? Uh, so, I would prefer Genjo. Are you asking me that question or are you making a statement to all of us that we are all from the same source? I think I'm making a statement, but it, it's also a question if you, you know, I'm putting that out that I, 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 I and, I and everybody else can trace their lineage back to Africa. And uh, um, race is a myth. Racism isn't. There you have it. So if we if if we're all of African descent, what's a, how do we identify uh, BIPOC just by saying BIPOC? Is that a better way of referring to it then? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this you you bring up you're probably a very good Zen practitioner because you're bringing up the complexities of of um, how we identify um, who we are in an anthropological sense. Um, and, and so on, political groupings, BIPOC might be considered a political grouping, affinity group, and so on. Um, but we can't, I don't think that we can leave out the ways that we've been acculturated, right? And it's the ways that we are acculturated, I think that, um, that promote right or wrong, the divisions. So for example, if uh, an enslaver, uh, was in the act of enslaving somebody and that uh, somebody was black bodied person and the enslaver is a white bodied person. If that black bodied person recognized the enslaver as being from the same continent, do you think that would have made a difference? Hmm. No, right. So we have to deal with the, the reality of, of our history. And um, I think if someone were who is white bodied would go to a BIPOC space and say, aren't we all African descended? Um, and with the expectation and the entitlement that they belong, um, I don't think that would be very skillful. So then we have to ask the question, what is the, what is the value of contemplating this question? Aren't we all from Africa? And um, I think it's worthy of contemplation, but then what do we do with it? Exactly. With the, when the answer is yes, if, if Lucy, Right. If Lucy is our original mother, right? Again, Joe, I'm meeting you for the first time, but I recognize you as kin. Right. I don't say you're a different species. I'm a different species. We're not related because of right. But I know that you've been treated differently than I have been. And how does that treatment make us different? I agree completely. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Genjo. Uh, someone else like to uh, raise hand and, and offer a comment or a question or a feeling or an observation. There's no limitation on what you might say here. I will fill in if we if we need. Okay, I thought there was someone else. I thought I saw Alyssa's hand. Oh, okay. I, well, I don't... you completely responded to it. I just had a, a reaction to what uh, Genjo said. So you to, you handled, you responded. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So in the interest of time, can we get down to the nitty gritty, the nastiness of the situation that we're in, that I think we're in? Oh, yeah. more hands. Okay. No, more hands. Let's, let's, let's hear from folks. I see Karen and, and Ula or Eula. Okay. Yeah, uh, Karen, please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and 
and then as soon as you're finished, Ula, go ahead and just follow right behind. First of all, thank you. And one of the things I've been contemplating is you mentioned coalitions. And um, I think a lot about the allies and coalitions. And I wonder if you have any wisdom for those about coalition building um, to bring about the kinds of radical changes that need to happen institutionally um, to eradicate institutionalized white supremacy, male supremacy, and I might add in capitalism, because I think that they're intended to serve the notion of power and profit being more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. And so if you have any guidance or any experience with that, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And, and I just want to remind you all that I'm here to learn from you, right? So um, I don't have uh, any wisdom. I will, I will say this though, this is what I'm trying. This is what I'm experimenting with. Whether Buddhist communities feel uh, that they have something to offer this country. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about interreligious dialogue with Christians. And uh, when I think about the torture and murder of George Floyd, and I think about the witnesses who were there trying to stop it, um, and the fact that they were then threatened by the same perpetrator, which then you know uh, made them pause. I think, is there an opportunity for Buddhist practitioners to be in coalition with Christians around justice making in the United States? And what would be that opportunity? And I've, I've shared this with a lot of people, but it hasn't taken yet, <laughs> but I'm gonna keep sharing it because I think there's something there. And it is um, the, I can say the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, right? The parable of the Good Samaritan as it is expressed in Good Samaritan laws in this country. And I think each one of us could look at, um, look at the Good Samaritan law in our state, if there is one. If there's not one, we need one. Uh, and if there is one, um, look at it to see if it's strong enough, right? Uh, these laws were passed years ago. I don't know if they're strong enough as it relates to how we might protect each other uh, in, in the, in the um, when, when the state is acting inappropriately against us, right? The police officers upon hearing the people in the crowd say, stop, the man's dying, right? He can't breathe, should have said, you're, oh my God, you're right. I've gone too far. I am here to protect you and this community. And that's not what I'm doing. I know that sounds ridiculous, right? But what if we had a mechanism where we could enact something like that? And because Buddhists in this country are smaller and much smaller in number than Christians, in order to effectuate change like that, we might uh, start talking with Christians about what are the things that we can do together to form this, this more perfect union or safer, safer world. But I'm here to learn from you. So two more, how about two more questions? And then I have questions for you all that I'd like to receive your answers to, if that's okay. Good, thanks. I, uh, we've okay. got two people. Uh, Ula, you've got your hand up, go ahead. And then following Ula, uh, Odell, uh, I see your hand as well, my friend. And uh, and and Odell, uh, when you're ready to speak, if, if you can let us see your handsome face, that would be nice too. <laughs> go ahead, Ula. So I am speaking, um, I'm speaking, uh, if, if I really pay attention to what people are saying, it's hard to formulate questions in, in the most, you know, in, in the, in the, in the leanest way. I, I think what's my point, but I, so I, I said, so I, I inherited some money from my mother. It was more money than I thought she had. 
and and um, and so my son and I are thinking about buying a house. And I said to him the other day, I said, "So you know, we have this money because of of uh, partly because we're white, because we have." Uh, intergener because the intergenerational transfer of wealth is is more if you're white you have more access to that i said and so so um so you know we're this is you know white supremacy is is we're we're experiencing the benefits of it and um and he got all upset with me like oh ma what are you talking about i mean you know i'm not you know blah 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 and i thought oh man i gotta think about how to how to talk about this, um, he, uh, I realized, and I've realized this before, I, that when you, to use those words makes white people feel shame, shame at being white. And, um, and I don't mind using those words because I have, I have, I, 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 I've thought, so over the years, I've decided I, I cannot afford to be ashamed of being white. I didn't ask to be white. I was born white. So I don't, I don't have to feel shame about being white, but I do have a responsibility to see, to see what that means in a functional social way. I have a responsibility to make sure that that, that is not abused and, and that, and that and not only is it not abused, but it is it is actually divested, divested. It needs to be, di it, we need to, we need to be willing to give that away, to give that, to, well, to, to, to not hang on to that, right? And so, so, so being a Buddhist now and being, you know, somewhat active in Zen peacemakers, and seeing how, seeing how Zen peacemakers, I mean, we, we, as a predominantly white organization, we make it a point to recognize incredible human suffering, incredible human pain, genocide, murder. I mean, everything that's, I mean, this is, this is one of the functions, you know, to, 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 to be open to all of that and, and to, and to bear witness to it. And, and then, you know, uh, it, uh, not knowing, opening up to understanding, to bear witness to it, and then to act. And so, and so, <laughs> So I, I feel like the peacemakers, they're, they're, it, it, it's in a sense, we have found it easier to bear witness to Holocaust survivors, to, bear, to, to the Holocaust. We found it easier to bear witness to Rwanda. We found it easier to bear witness to um, what happened to the Native Americans. And we find it harder to bear witness to racism, particularly racism where it involves, well, particularly the black community. We find that that okay. kind of racism. I'm hard. interrupting you for a moment to ask you, ask you, Ula, do you have a question? I agree with you. I don't, I don't know, but I felt, <laughs> um, I, I guess my question is really directed to The point of we're so we're starting to do all this, uh, all this. Um, Ula, this I'm interrupting you again. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get to it. Um, and, and I will be quiet if I don't have a question. Maybe I should try this later. That's well, correct. how much more explaining do you need to do? Just say it. Put it out there. Well, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to figure out what it is. I'm trying to put out there. Okay. Um, so, so, I'm still. I let me think about it more. Really, I spoke too soon, and I okay. It, yeah, thank you. Are you wait a minute, hold on. Are you gonna promise me that yes. you'll come back with a question? And if I if I if I don't have it formulated today, it will be formulated. Oh no, I, the, we've got time for you to formulate it. Please promise me that you will come back with I will, a question. I will I'm, on, I, I'm with your conclusion. 
it is hard to look at, at things happening at home. And that's why I want to talk to y'all. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ula, uh, from me, thank you so much for being willing to to not know in front of all of us. <laughs> Slightly embarrassing, but whatever. <laughs> don't, don't be embarrassed. You're, you're among friends here. Uh, Odell, you've been patiently with your hand up, and thank you for uh, turning on your video so we can we can see you, my friend. Thank you. I uh, just want to say thank you for talking with us today. And um, the reason I have my camera off, my wife's put my son to sleep, uh, my one-year-old son. So they might come in behind me. <laughs> he might come running in. But um, what I wanted to say, I, I won't go into any explanations, uh, but just a little bit of background. I am Mexican and of Native American descent. So this... I work remotely from home, um, but I have had a lot of family members affected by COVID and just seeing all this, witnessing everything that's going on in our country the past year, uh, it has brought up a lot of rage in me. And that's something I've really put on the back burner when I meditate or practice. Um, you know, I try to work on other personal issues rather than uh, you know, the more societal stuff, just because I, you know, I use the excuse, I'm stuck at home, working remote, I have a son now, you know, got to think about him. Um, but I do meet with uh, one group, mostly all white, and you were bringing up the, I think it was again, Joe brought up that, you know, the, aren't we all of African descent? And like, so it has forced me to confront this um, this rage or fire inside me about you know white privilege and racism because I did have someone say uh, we're on Slack now this group I'm in and he's like testing is this India Columbus or something and like I said I'm Native American so I'm like ooh and I told this the group leader about it. And he was like, oh, you should have said something. You should have been sarcastic or, you know, you should have been straight to the point. He's also white. And I was like, no, I didn't want to be unskillful with my words. Um, so my question is you, how, how do you successfully merge your, because um, you do, you said your, your book is called Black and Buddhist. I have yet to find a way to successfully merge my my heritage with my Buddhist identity um, without raising a lot of questions, especially around white people, because they're like, oh, I don't see color or something. They don't say that anymore. <laughs> they don't say things like, "I'm oh, we're all of African descent uh, because I've confidently talked to them. But like, even now when I'm talking about, like, I'm getting all worked up, like I can feel my body getting warm and stuff, but, um, do you have any tips for me as a person of color <laughs> going well, forward? I, um, mm, ooh, yes, I do. <laughs> um, I, I do. I think if it's really important for you to do this work, is it really important for you to do this work, this integration of your uh, various ways that you identify? I think it is because um, okay. when I started, I didn't think so. I just yeah. thought they were different, like I could have different mm -hmm. identities and they were like side by side. But now that, like you were saying, integrating, yeah, uh, there's so no this, really separation. Here's my recommendation. If it's important to you, just claim it as important to you, even if it's not important to other people around you, or it's not even important for them to do that work for themselves. You claim that for yourself, that's important for you to do. And um, you could state that it's important for you to do without relying on people who don't find it important, right? Just state it, but you don't rely on them to help you do it because they haven't done it themselves or they deny that it's important or what have you. So I would suggest that you, um, that you find people for whom it, that is important and then be in conversation with them about it. 
it's worthy. It's it's really important for our well-being, for our psychological well-being to feel whole. Where various parts of ourselves are integrated are uh, um, and so that you don't have the, I don't know, unconscious impulses to deny parts of yourself and negate parts of yourself that would then um, justify you not claiming your rage, mm -hmm. for example, right? Because isn't rage an appropriate feeling to genocide? Yes. For example, <laughs> for example, but not if we, if we don't talk about it, right? If we don't talk about torture, if we don't talk about coup, if we don't talk about um, the government engaged in the willful neglect of people, um, as well as the constant undermining of science, um, all of these things contributing to more deaths in this country than it needed to be and continues to be. So that would be my advice to you, Adele. Be with people who will support your journey. Thank you. Or, and or put it this way, you can be with people who don't support your journey, but share your journey with people who support you, you on that right. path. Yeah. Okay. Odell, thank you so much for your question. I really appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Now, can I ask some questions? It's all yours. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. But let me check in with Ula first. You got, is your question together? I think, I think my question is, um, my question is for us peacemakers. I, I don't think we are turning inward enough. I, I, my question is why are we still so white? And, and I don't feel like we're asking that question. Okay, why are we still so white? That's the question. Because okay. there are, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, today, or the, for the rest of our time, I'm sorry, I'm fidgeting just with my uh, various views uh, going back and forth to people. Our conversation today may not be so much about race, right, and the composition of our sanghas um, and why they are as they are, um, but that conversation is an important conversation that will continue for who knows how long, right? I think um, as more people uh, find that they have permission to practice Buddhism in this country, right? Um, the, the, uh, the plurality that is our reality, the reality is plurality, uh, we'll see more and more uh, manifestations of our ethnicities in our communities. And, and we will continue to have intercultural exchanges and, and uh, conflicts and hopefully um, growing appreciation for one another. But today what I'd like to talk about is, what I'd like to ask you is, in the United States, have we survived? And I could ask this in different ways, but I'm gonna ask it this way first. Have we survived a genocide current time. I'm not talking about the genocide of Native American people in, these, in, the, in, in this, in, on these lands. Have we with, let's see, maybe at least 600,000 Americans having died from COVID as of this morning, 600,000 thereabouts. Have we survived a genocide? And I'm asking you, those of you who have borne witness to the aftermath of genocide, what do you think? If you have a comment, once again, please go down to reactions and raise your electronic hand and I'll, I'll watch for your hand. Uh, Genjo, please go ahead. I think of uh, the Native American situation is definitely genocide and Rwanda gen genocide and Cambodia genocide and, and the old Yugoslavia genocide and I can go on. 
Uh, I'm not sure that a pandemic is genocide, even though I'm so angry at this rejecting science uh, uh, is a kind of um, craziness that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. I don't know that that qualifies in my mind as genocide, even though rejecting science has done that. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Ellen, uh, you- Or got... concerts, I'm sorry, other answers. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm gonna see if I can figure out taking my hand down, lower hand. Um, I think you're asking a really hard and important question. Um, and as someone of Jewish heritage, one of the things I think about is when I think about the Holocaust, it did not just target Jews, right? It targeted Jews for genocide, but it targeted political activists. It targeted, had a broader target, but genocide was a big piece of what happened there, but it wasn't the whole story. And so that's why I think your question is a really serious question because it's very clear that the whole story of that 600,000 people is not genocide. But I, um, I was the executive director last spring of a small nonprofit and I had one African heritage employee. She lost six people in eight weeks. None of us lost six people in eight weeks. And that was very clear. I mean, you know, and then we went, moved to Black Lives Matter. Like we just we just backed her. Like there was nothing to do except say whatever you need. Um, but none of us had that level of loss. And it's not, we weren't all white, Arab, different, but none of us had that level of loss. And so in that context, um, there is definitely a way that if we quantify that 600 and look how off it is from the numbers of the diversity of our country and who got hit, it looks more like genocide. Thank you. I'm having a hard time navigating. Um, the pins are off. Okay, Ellen, thank you, Ellen. I want to see your name. Thank you, Ellen. Other answers, I see three. What? Bree, Martine, Justin. Martine, I think you were first in line, so go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. And thank you so much for raising your hand. Yeah, I just briefly <clears throat> asked the question. My gut was, yes, we are inside right now. And it's um, what makes me upset. It what helps me practice that the more aware I've become in Zen peacemakers and Zen practice, and I see with more awareness, all the divisions, you know, race, economics, I'm just opening up to um, the pain and suffering. So Zen practice does make me realize that um, people of color, indigenous people, black people, um, women, um, people around the world, you know, it opens me up to that. So I do feel we are in a state of ignorant genocide and we, um, and I, I really appreciate your thoughts on naming things. So I'm going to think about that a lot. Um, I have very much naming what we're talking about. So to become more aware, thank you. That's all I had to say for today. Thank you, Martine. Thank you. Justin, you, uh, you are next in the queue here. If you'd like to unmute, thank you so much for raising your hand. And ooh, oh my gosh, okay, the, the hands are being raised. And then, okay, so I wanna do this. Uh, four more questions and then I, uh, I'm sorry, four more answers and then I have another question, okay? Um, so first off, I'm in the cafeteria right now, so I'm sorry for uh, background noise. I'll, I'll try to be concise and then mute again as soon as possible. Um, I don't know if my gut reaction to, the, to that question is that uh, would, would be a no, but that's only, I think that's only because, um, as Ellen mentioned earlier, like my only example of, of genocide within my life, well, not within my lifetime, but the only one that I've so far known about has been the Holocaust. So, has been what? I think I've Just been, been the Holocaust. Oh, okay. Uh, so, I think I've kind of been conditioned to, when, when encountering the word genocide, I think I've been conditioned to, to, to look for willful, um, like mass organized extermination. Um, but on the other hand, I also think that it's 
even if June is not the right word, I also think that the maybe terminal neglect or or like mass negligence or something. I, I'm not sure of the, of the correct term I would use, but I do think that the um, the neglect of, of minority communities has kind of led to led to a lot of deaths and then just a little context. I'm just got out of prison. I'm in a halfway house right now, which is why uh, there's so much noise going on around me. But viewing the pandemic from uh, from behind prison walls and kind of watching other people you know, lose people to either built to the pandemic and also to fatality or um, general street violence or just other uh, other types of, 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 of loss um, and, and, and witnessing the sense of powerlessness uh, that kind of comes along with it can definitely, I think, engender a certain kind of rage that if not handled skillfully can get aimed um, anywhere. Um, and I, I don't necessarily know how I was going with that, uh, but uh, to wrap it up, uh, short answer, no, long answer, yes, but in a just uh, by neglig negligence, if I could say that. Um, I think I'll say that. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Bree, uh, you you have your hand up. Uh, please go ahead and mute. Yeah. Thank I'll you. I'll just I'll just say it very quickly. I mean, I think that personally, I feel complicit in supporting systemic practices that result in health disparities. And I think from that perspective, I do feel that we're bearing witness to genocide. I don't know that it was intentional um, as it relates to COVID, but I think that. Um, for me personally, I feel torn, not torn, but feel very, um, you know, disappointed and angry with myself that I've been blind to so many practices that have resulted in this. And just yesterday, I had someone ask me about pregnancy related deaths in the US, and I looked up the rates for individuals who identify as black versus those who identify as white, and it's like, three to four times the rate. And, you know, I think if you take any health issue and you look at it, you can't help but identify the, the, the you know, the inequality and the discrimination and how that results in death. So um, that's my quick response. Thank you, Bree. I, uh, we have two more hands up. Uh, do, do we have time for- Yeah, two more. more. Yeah, two more. Please keep them uh, lean. Thank you. Uh, Chella, go ahead, go ahead, please, from uh, San Diego. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Ayo. Um, it's interesting, you know, the question was, have we survived a genocide? And uh, so many amazing answers talking about um, whether what it is that we have survived is a genocide. Um, and it's beautiful, beautifully put. But when I heard the question, the question I heard was, have we survived it? And, you know, not what is it that we have survived, but have we survived? And uh, I just, you know, it just kind of brought up all these kind of parts of me that have kind of died with the pandemic that haven't survived, right? The anxiety I have, the confidence in leadership, mm -hmm. uh, the confidence in people to like believe in science, <laughs> um, ability to just go out and walk down the street and not be afraid of a person breathing on me. All those things have died. So in a way, I kind of haven't survived this genocide um, in a kind of metaphorical sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. How do I pronounce your name? Uh, Chowa. Thank you, Chowa. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. And uh, my colleague and friend, Myoshin, please go ahead and... Uh... Thank you. Um, Aya, when you asked the question about... Um the relationship between genocide and COVID, um, I had to think about the definition that you were using and I wasn't really sure, so I had to look it up. And um, genocide normally is uh, defined as the deliberate and systemic extermination of a national racial, political or cultural group. So as far as that definition goes, um, 
I don't see COVID um, pandemic as a genocide, even though there is a disparity between the poor and the rich um, in receiving the vaccines and receiving the healthcare. Um, it's affecting everyone all over the world. And if anything, it's uniting um, nations in the same goal of trying to, to combat this thing together. Um, but um, in considering the genocide too, though, um, I, I was also thinking, um, you know, you mentioned interest, um, intercultural dialogue is important. So, but um, interdisciplinary and interfaith um, dialogues are pertinent. It's it, it critical in, of critical importance with the consideration of uh, intersectionality of um, gender issues as well. Um, so we are surviving the massacres due to the lack of gun control. Um, you know, I'm th thinking of the Asian women being massacred. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miyoshin. Thank you. So I wanted to put the word genocide out there. And, and let me say, this word didn't come to me initially as we were, you know, discovering um, that there was a, a, a virus, you know, COVID-19, um, first discovered in Wuhan, China in December uh, 2000. But when it was announced in the United States that, um, that there was a racial disparity around who was getting it and who was surviving it. After having had some kind of agreement nationally that we were going to lock down to eradicate, that was part of it, we're gonna lock down to eradicate. When it was, became public knowledge that there was a racial disparity that black and brown people were being hit really hard with it. From the top, from the executive office, there was a change in tone from locking down to opening up. And it was rather immediate. And that's what got me thinking, oh, part of the herd, the, the race to herd immunity may include the deaths of brown and black people. So we will engage in um, the practice of, and, and, and you can see the increase in the intensity around undermining the science. Trump talked about it in terms of downplaying. I wanted to thank goodness for a Bob Woodward downplaying the intensity, downplaying the threat. It wasn't just downplaying, it was actively cutting off at press conferences, cutting off uh, the uh, discourse between journalists and Dr. Fauci, mm -hmm. where Trump would insert himself, you may remember multiple times saying crazy stuff, right? In order to get us to, think that COVID was not that dangerous. And then maybe, it, there's a lot of stuff I know we would like to forget, right? But I wanna bring it back into our, our consciousness. Liberate Minnesota, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia, right? And then within days, armed, armed Americans entering the Michigan Capitol building in protest of what? Public health measures, armed to the nines to protest wearing masks. And now the question is why is Michigan in the shape it's in right now? 
why is Minnesota in the shape it's in right now? We did not take the precautions when we should have. Because on the executive level, there was an opening, uh, there was an attempt to reopen the, the country after it was known of the racial disparities. So when we think about genocide, does it have to, like uh, Justin was saying, I thought genocide looked like this. In essence, Justin, that's what I was picking up from you. I thought genocide looked like this. Genocide can look like a lot of things. And what better way to get rid of people than to let a pandemic fester? Because you, your hands are not on it, right? Okay. Whether we agree about whether there's been a genocide, whether there's a genocide taking place, whether we have survived it, what's been lost from it, what can be gained from it, whether there is a, a political, a national cooperation to eradicate it, you know, just again, was that the time to defund or I'm sorry, divest from who? From the World Health Organization in the beginning of a pandemic? Is that the time? Okay. My question is, what are we to do now? What do we do now? I never thought in my life that I would live through something like this. I thought, uh, the Ch Choa, I never thought a president of the United States would undermine the health of his own country but that's what we live through. What do we do now? What does the wisdom of your practice, your bearing witness to the aftermath of mass killings say to us? What are the steps? What is one step, one real step we can take to minimize, to mitigate these ongoing deaths and the death instinct we have as a nation? from your experience of bearing witness, do we have to wait until many more people have died before we say, oh my God, I can't believe what we did. I can't believe we did that. That's my last question. Let's, let's, let's bring our moral imagination, our creativity to bear. We have about 10 minutes, everybody. So if you uh, would, uh, once again, please use your electronic hand and uh, I'll watch for you and call you in the order that you raise your hand. Uh, Ellen, you have your hand up. Thank you. So I would say I am continuing to do what I have figured out doing, which is I am an act local person. And for me, act local means I'm in Boston. I have three very dear friends who are African-American women who are all struggling in their lives for different reasons that have everything to do with structural racism. Um, and so one of them has had a health crisis and she's, she's hanging out at my house for a couple of months and I'm figuring out right now how to get her a Johnson & Johnson vaccine so that she only has to get one shot. Um, that's what I know how to do is try to figure out how to attend better to the people I'm connected to um, and show up with maybe some more diligence than I might otherwise. Thanks, Ellen. Um, we've got a couple Thank of you. hands up of, of folks who have spoken uh, already. If anybody else is inclined, uh, I'm going to pause here for 15 seconds or so and and feel free to uh, to raise your hand otherwise I'll, I'll go to the people with their hands up now Odell why don't you go ahead you're you're the next one here thank you um I had a quick question for everyone and for io uh but before that I wanted to make a quick note so part of my research when I was in uh grad school was on genocide and one thing that a lot of people like to do especially uh, I found white people is they like to say how systematic genocide is 
um, most of the time and all of the genocides, I think someone was listing them earlier. They just listed like all the recent ones in the 20th century. Uh, they all didn't start out as systematic. They started out with one group taking it too far and then it built momentum and it kept going and going until it became systematized, specifically like the Holocaust, which everyone keeps bringing up. And it wasn't just against Jews, right? It was, it was meant against everyone who opposed the Reich. So think of it more in terms of functionality when you hear genocide and try to apply that to what Io asked about COVID. Um, so my, my question is like, what do we do now? Um, I really don't know. That's why I kind of came to this. <laughs> Came to this meeting, Jeff knows I've been coming to a lot of these now because <laughs> I'm trying to figure. Okay, it, I, I'm vaccinated, um, and it's like okay, it's probably gonna open up here in the fall, maybe I don't know. But when things do, I don't want things to go back to normal. I'm not white, so it wasn't it wasn't great for me. Um, still not. Um, so I just I don't know where we go from here or what we do now. I would like some guidance. Well, hey, hey, you have the guidance. You did research on this very topic. What have you done with your research? I'll go. Sat in on this meeting. Oh, huh? <laughs> or sat on to it. People. <laughs> I guess inform people of my research. Have, have you done that? Only to a few individuals. Oh, what can, what can we do? Okay, here's something we can do right now. What can we do to encourage you to bring your, your research out? And let's say you just wanna share, I mean, what you shared with us right that then, right that point that you made about how these things begin is critical. What else from your research might you bring out with ZPI and ZPI perhaps can carry some of your research forward to understand how these things happen and how it is happening in the United States. That's a good point. Jeff, did you catch that by chance? I did, and, 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 and you and I will talk offline. <laughs> All right. That's wonderful. Okay. We've got two more hands up here, and we've got about four, uh, four and a half minutes. So if we can keep our comments really tight, uh, Genjo and then Alicia, please. Well, real quick, quick, you know, uh, I, we have to cry and we have to be angry and then we have to act somehow. And the things that we're doing here in Seattle as uh, working with, uh, we're a very blue state, but we can use that to change laws at the state level to um, have more police accountability, to get more people out of prison, to uh, get people to be able to vote when they're out of prison. The governor just signed a law to, to uh, we're supporting something called real rent for the local tribe that's not recognized by the, the Duwamish, who is not recognized by the federal government, but our temple pays rent. Um, the, the, uh, we, we have to make hay with the opportunity that we have uh, with things turning a little bit more blue to push this agenda uh, now and uh, not waste any time. Although I got to keep crying and being angry in order to have the energy to do it. Thank you. This is, yeah, let's not squander. Let's not squander these moments, right? We have a lot of repair to do and to acknowledge how we really feel is, is critical, right? To moving through it. Thank Alicia, let's uh, we'll 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 take your comment and keep brief if you would, and then uh, we'll let uh, Io and uh, and Willie wrap up here. Sure, uh, I think the question Io's question is, what can we do now regarding the pandemic? Is that correct, Io? Yeah, yeah, uh, Alicia. Yes. Thank yes, you, Alicia. Alicia. Um, what can we do um, if, if we don't just look at it as pandemic, but mo mm. what is this death instinct? Uh, nation, is there such word as nation side instinct? What can we do um, to 
um, mitigate the effects of, of, of um, being at the very least willfully neglectful of how the pandemic is impacting uh, people of color? Uh, two things that I thought of are that, you know, a lot of the, you know, essential workers are people of color. And I think that employers could be protecting their workers much better. So many people die because they were forced to work in circumstances where they were at risk you know, mm -hmm. showing up in meat factories or mm -hmm. wherever, yeah. uh, they could have done a much better job to protect people of color because that definitely was genocide to me because they mm -hmm. were forcing them to work in unsafe conditions. Mm -hmm. um, just the push of Amazon, I see in my neighborhood, Amazon trucks coming constantly and I wonder, I worry for the workers and all the people I see delivering are black men. Um, uh, another point is I live in the state of Maryland, which is in the county that houses the, the national NIH. And then a few counties over is the uh, Johns Hopkins where they're doing infectious disease. They're always discovering it. In the state of Maryland, I haven't even been able to get a shot. It's so poorly run. And I wonder how much of that is because we're also a lot of people of color in the state of Maryland. And it really makes mm -hmm. me wonder about that, that mm -hmm. our governor has so poorly thought out how to get people vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I noticed the people I know who are vaccinated tend to be white. And that's not a coincidence. No. So those are two things that they are intentionally not looking out for black communities. And I live right outside Washington, DC, where, mm -hmm. you know, where I know that a lot of people of color, black people in DC are not getting vaccinated and white people are coming from the rich sections and going to the black neighborhoods mm -hmm. to get vaccinated. I mm -hmm. hear these stories and I know it's true. So we know that they are not, well, the systems, the local systems are not looking out for people of color. So they are definitely contributing to our death. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Isn't Hogan your, your governor? Yes. Yes, and he's uh, terrible. I think. Yeah, so so <laughs> he needs to be uh, yes. confronted because he wants Absolutely. to be president, and he yeah, can't be can't... president doing this kind of stuff. Oh, he's awful. I think. Okay, uh, so ZPI, um, ZPI, think about please. Oh, it, our time has come to a close. I will say this: um, it's so important uh, that we have these conversations. I'm so glad that we could have this conversation you have uh, resources uh, that you can bring to bear um, for shifting our consciousness and giving us courage and permission to use the words we need to be using uh, to define what is taking place so that we can have an appropriate response um, to what is taking place. This is a, a very dangerous country we're living in. We could have talked about many, many instances of, um, of the yeah. dangers um, that we're seeing, but we don't have, we didn't even have enough time to, to talk about a fraction of them. So um, I'm a member of ZPI. I was so glad to learn that ZPI existed because I didn't, like I've been looking for Zen peacemakers and I didn't realize, you know, Jeff told me about the history and who's doing what. I'm a member, um, I feel, um, encourage being a member of an organization that is courageous enough to be present and bear, bear witness, tell the truth of the pain that we're causing each other. Because it seems to me um, that is the way forward. We can't face anything. We can't, we can't address anything if we're not willing to face it. And we can better face these things together. So thank you for this opportunity. Reverend Willie Mukai Smith. Yes, my Close sister. Close us out. Close us I'm, out, brother man. I'm going to say that I am very happy that you put a mirror up for us to take a very good long look at ourselves. Because the words that you've said have made us all uncomfortable. And, you know, sometimes we need to be a little uncomfortable. You know, turn up the heat. But it's time to take a good look and to really... Uh, bear witness to what we do and what we don't do. You know, as someone, I think it was Martin Luther King just said, you know, uh, silence sometimes is also complicit, being complicit, and we can't afford to be complicit. So thank you for the mirror for us to take a good, long look at ourselves. <laughs>